Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening and good morning and good afternoon to all the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, the atheists, the agnostics, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and yes, even you metaphysical solipsists who are watching from all around the world. I am your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me right now is Dr. Michael Brown. How's it going, Dr. Brown? Going great, man. Love the intro there. Nicely done. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you you have to do an intro because uh, it takes it takes uh, people a, a couple minutes to get online. So you don't want to hit your most important topics at the beginning because uh, it'll take several minutes for people to get on. So you just do intros and everything else to uh, to uh, to to kill the time. Um, all right. Uh, just in case people uh, haven't been following you for years, um, what are you a doctor of? So my PhD is in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from New York University. So I focused on the ancient Semitics, Hebrew language, and the Semitic languages related to that. That was, that was my main focus. Okay, so uh, Biblical Hebrew, was that in there? B yeah, yeah, Biblical, biblical Hebrew, Hebrew, then of course, you know, all, all phases of it. So Rabbinic Hebrew and, and uh, medieval literature, you know, we looked at, although that you know, that comes in later. And then, of course, Aramaic and its various forms, the ancient Aramaic, biblical Aramaic, Syriac, and the J Jewish Aramaic forms, classical Arabic, and then Akkadian, which is Babylonian and Assyrian, and some of the other related languages and dialects, Ugaritic and Phoenician, Punic, those things. So mm -hmm. related languages, but that, that was the field. And a few others I had to touch on, just a little Ethiopic and Old South Arabian, but I, did, I didn't really study those much. Mm -hmm. Now... Should have probably saved this for later, but since we're talking about uh, languages here in Biblical Hebrew, what did you do when you read Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, and saw Muhammad mentioned by name in the verse? <laughs> okay, so I will avoid uh, my sarcastic <laughs> response, which is uh, coming out of my pores as you're asked the question. I, I mean, it's, it's like saying that David Wood... Was, was mentioned in the Bible because the word would uh, occurred, and then elsewhere you had David, and so how, how else could you, could you possibly explain it? I mean, the, the, the fact is the name Muhammad is a Semitic name, and, it, and many names come from related nouns and things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm in the Bible, Michael's in the Bible, Michael, who is like God. It, it's uh, honestly, having read the Hebrew Bible for decades, the idea that this was a secret reference to Muhammad was so far-fetched that when I first heard it, I, I thought it was a joke, honestly. Yeah. Oh, and uh, speaking speaking of uh, speaking of jokes, uh, I didn't think this was a joke, but um, uh, I didn't realize that same so a lot of the same arguments that I think uh, are bad from Muslims, um, sometimes there are... Jewish, uh, what do you call them? Counter missionaries. Yeah, they're yeah, they're yeah. Jewish counter missionaries who use similar arguments. So I was at a, uh, a Messianic Jewish uh, apologetics conference, and I was talking about Muslim objections to the deity of Christ. And uh, one of them, of course, is um, God is not a man that he should lie. And I was pointing that out as a as a pretty silly um, objection. And uh, anyway, some of the Messianic Jews came up to me afterwards and said, "No, we hear this. We hear the exact same thing from uh, from 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 counter missionaries. And in fact, all the ones that I um, used from the Old Testament that um, I hear from Muslims, um, they were saying they also heard from uh, from the the counter missionaries. So this is a good. Uh, this would be a good opportunity to share a little bit about your ministry. I uh, just wanted to answer one quick comment here. Miss Bluebird says." Uh, is David Wood a doctor too? What is his degree in? Yeah, my uh, my degree is in philosophy. So I'm a philosopher, which means basically that um, I sit around examining arguments, which, uh, yeah, so that's what I do. All right, now back to Dr. Brown. Um, so Dr. Brown, your, uh, your website information and um, uh, YouTube page, that's all in the description box. So those of you who want to follow Dr. Brown, um, the information's all there in the description box. Um, what exactly do you focus on for your ministry? And I know you actually focus on, on many things because I see you uh, going in a lot of different directions sometimes. But uh, uh, yeah, what do you do? Yeah, so there, there are several different areas of work. One is Jewish apologetics as a Jewish follower of Jesus, reaching Jewish people with the gospel 
and responding to Jewish objections, many of which are, are serious, many of which really delve into the Hebrew language, many of which are based on hundreds of years of, of serious study of the text. So we, we equip, written many volumes on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. I debate rabbis and do outreach. Our materials go, go throughout Israel. Uh, so we're constantly doing outreach to the Jewish people and answering objections, doing apologetics. That's one major thing. A second thing is we're on the front lines of the culture wars. Uh, my daily radio show, The Line of Fire, I'm introduced as your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. So the real hot button, difficult topics of, of the day, ranging from LGBT activism and the church reaching out with compassion while standing for, for righteousness, abortion, other, other areas in terms of, of moral decline in America, we're addressing that. And then my heart is, is always to awaken the church so that our hearts are stirred to a fresh encounter with God. And, and with that, uh, we go to the nations. I've been overseas almost 200 times. In fact, I was supposed to be in Nigeria uh, right now, but my visa uh, came through too late to travel. So we're, we're just going to be Skyping over to Nigeria. And then we train and teach people, send them out to the nations as well. So I normally write about five articles a week, op-ed pieces that are on various sites dealing with what's happening in the culture around us or spiritually related issues. And then Jewish outreach. Uh, and and also there are books that I'll, I'll write, I've written 30-something books now, from biblical commentaries to apologetics works, but also books that tackle doctrinal controversies. Craig Keener and I just put out together, Not Afraid of the Antichrist, Why We Don't Believe in a Pre-Tribulation Rapture. That just came out a couple days ago. Uh, I'll write books on the abuse of the grace message or Can You Be Gay and Christian? So we got a lot of books dealing with those controversial issues as well. And uh, 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 Dr. Craig Keener, how, how many Christians do you know who are cooler than Dr. Keener? Yeah, you know, the, the, the miracle of this book is that the two of us wrote it together, and it's like 250 pages, mm -hmm. because, you know, he writes a book like that a day. Yeah. His, his Acts commentary is, you know, 6,000 pages if printed out normally, and, but a humble guy, loves the Lord, and just, just a real student of the Word, great, a great brother. Yeah, for those of you uh, who, who are familiar with Dr. Keener, I think uh, Gary Habermas said he asked him about his daily output, and he can, he can, he can put out uh, around 20 finished pages of text uh, a day which is i mean that's insane right S single line single yeah yeah, line. yeah so not, yeah not, not double space yeah, yeah so uh -huh. that that's amazing i mean i would have to it would have to be like the last day of the semester and i've got three papers due and uh, you know i've had like eight red bulls to put out anywhere close to that and it would not it would not be very good um so the fact that he could do that regularly when he's in writing mode that's just uh that's just amazing uh someone said here one one person said here uh why can't i hear anything but i haven't seen anyone else say that so everyone else is responding to what we're talking to so i would say um turn your audio turn your audio on <laughs> something like that i'm assuming no one else i'm assuming no one else uh is having the uh, problem here oh and by the way on the on the issue of um uh your work in uh uh dialoguing with um um with jews that, that was actually the first time i ever saw you was on i don't remember how long ago this was what 12 no like 15 years ago, I saw you on Faith Under Fire with Rabbi uh, Rabbi Shmule. Oh, yeah, yeah, with Lee Strobel. In, in fact, uh, God willing, Shmule and I should be doing another another debate in the New York area in August of this year. We'll, we'll keep you posted on it. But, yeah, we, we've done many, many debates. And, you know, look, it's easy for us to tear down straw men. Mm -hmm. and, and like the Muhammad thing in, in Song of Songs, the fifth chapter is is one of those. Uh, you know, one of those really weak objections. But we know with, with each faith, with, you know, there, there are sophisticated arguments that at, at first sound very intimidating and imposing. And a lot of people get scared by that. When, when I came to faith, brand new believer with, with no, no solid academic background in this, and started to talk with religious Jews, rabbis that were really learned that had been studying Hebrew since they were children, it was intimidating. It was, it was overwhelming. I mean, and I knew the Lord had saved me and changed me, but the arguments w were very imposing. So I determined I'm going to follow the truth wherever it leads. Uh, God, I, I just want you and your truth. And then, of course, with each year of study and learning, you, your faith is strengthened. You, you find out that we're on the side of truth. But sometimes knowing that someone's been there, done that is a real help and encouragement to others. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone is, is you know, a, a Muslim is, is wrestling with coming to Jesus and is struggling, and then they, they stumble on your YouTube channel and start seeing, oh, okay, here's a guy that knows this stuff and is answering forcefully, it really does help a lot.
Hmm. And um, I, I was really impressed by that uh, by uh, that debate with with Rabbi Shmule because uh, you guys argue on a a different level from what most even Christian apologists would be familiar with. Like if people ask me, uh, "Hey, you know, wh- where does the Old Testament talk about Jesus?" You know, it's it's Isaiah fifty three. Um, Isaiah 9, 6, you have a couple of, of go-to passages, but you guys were, were, were going into a, a much deeper level back and forth very, very quickly. So um, we want to get to your, to your testimony here in a, in a moment, but if someone were to ask, um, why should we believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, uh, what would you say? Well, I'd say to them first that he's the only possible candidate, and if it's not him, that we'll never have a Messiah. That I could demonstrate the Messiah had to come, die for our sins, and rise from the dead before the second temple was destroyed, which happened in the year 70. I would say that he had to be the one who was rejected on a national level by his people, but became a light for the nations so that he's followed around the world and has brought multitudes of people to worship the God of Israel. I'd also point out that as Jewish people, that the temple's been destroyed for almost 2,000 years. And I would ask, what sin have we committed that's so grave that the temple has still stood in ruins, not been rebuilt in all this time? And I'd ask if God ordained the sacrificial system for atonement uh, in conjunction with repentance, etc. Without that, without the blood, where do we have atonement? So... From a number of different levels, I would show through various prophecies and through spiritual principles that he must be our Messiah. Uh, uh, Today, I got a phone call from an Orthodox Jew from Israel. He was talking to some Messianic Jews there, and and he raised some issues to them, and they told him to call my show. He was very polite, called from Israel, and we were talking back and forth, and I said, okay, we agree that the first temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed because of idolatry, because of, of murder and injustice, immorality, and, and it was destroyed for several hundred years before it was rebuilt. We agree on that. Yes, I said, and why was the second temple destroyed? According to Jewish tradition, it's, it's sinat chinam, which is baseless hatred. I said, do you believe that's why the second temple was destroyed? Yes, baseless hatred. I said, and it still is in ruins to this day. I said, could it have been baseless hatred against the Messiah? which, of course, the New Testament explicitly teaches. They, they hated me without cause. I mean, what sin would be so great and a sin that we've continued to commit by continuing to reject him? So obviously we unpack all those in great depth, but that would be my, my short answer. And by the way, to, uh, as to that last point, what, what, is, the, what is the response there? Do, is there is, what's the alternative to Jesus as far as um, why the, the temple has not been, been rebuilt? Yeah, it, it's an interesting thing, and of course, t- for traditional Jews, it's a cause of, of mourning. Uh, the Talmud does say it was baseless hatred, but it was it was hatred w- within the people of Israel, that there was strife and incivility and things like that, and that led to other problems and bloodshed. But I- again, it's, it's one of those questions where I've not gotten a good, solid answer. I've received humble answers in terms of our ongoing sin or we haven't been worthy of the temple being rebuilt. But the comparison that the Talmud makes, and to me the weakness of the answer about baseless hatred, um, underscores the problem. And bear in mind that, that the Talmud is, it comes to its editorial conclusion 5600 A.D., so even then it was a question and problem. How much more now when so much more mm-hmm. time has elapsed? Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um uh yeah uh also since you um since you brought up the the various things that you uh that you do ministry wise dealing with uh, uh social issues moral issues um and uh, objections to christianity um i i saw that you had uh tweeted recently that you had been demonetized by youtube and this is an ongoing issue because almost pretty almost everyone i have on here is having problems with being deplatformed or, or demonetized or uh, having content removed from YouTube or, or other sources. So uh, tell us what happened there. Yeah, so there, there are two separate issues that may well be related, but they both come to light in the last uh, two weeks. In fact, uh, Tucker Carlson brought up our situation, not by name, but last night specifically referenced it. So it's, it's in the news now. The first thing happened last year 
that uh, we put out our video, kind of like a PragerU type video, the first in our series called Consider This. So scripted, animated, about six minutes long, Can You Be Gay and Christian? Mm -hmm. and, and anyone who watches it knows we look at biblical content. We're not hateful. We, we, we lay out the issues. We offer forgiveness and redemption for all. And for the first time, we had a little money to advertise on YouTube. So we advertised the video. And because of the content of the video, it, it, having words like gay and things like that, it ended up being advertised. So five-second ad comes on, you know, can you be gay and Christian? It ended up being advertised on some gay YouTube channels and some transgender uh, YouTube okay. channels. Yeah. All right, so that created an uproar, firestorm. And I just saw one the other day, one of the videos attacking me, and they play a lot of the clips. So we're not objecting to it. You know, they have me upside down and changing my voice and all that. But one video alone critiquing me has been viewed 11 million times, okay? Mm -hmm. So there was a firestorm virtually every gay website talking about it. There's my picture. There's the video. Uh, Forbes wrote about it. Business Insider wrote about it. It got to the point where YouTube and Google issued a public apology for ads that, were, were, that shouldn't have been running. And then they said to us, okay, your video is demonetized and you can never advertise it again. All right. Well, that's what we knew last year. What just came to light, a Christian working at Google, a whistleblower, software engineer, reported on an email exchange that Google employees got upset over the video. It was a microaggression to them. They said it is very counter to our mission. That's an exact quote. Very counter to our mission. And in, in fact, uh, it, it made its way up till... Vice President Vishal Sharma, who reviewed the video numerous times with the team and said, listen, we are a platform, open platform for spe free speech, but not like this. Mm. And this, this is degrading to, uh, to people for who they are, sexual orientation. So because of that, this cannot be advertised. So the fact that it was Google employees that, that created some of this problem and that a VP has come out basically saying – my words, because of the biblical Christian content here, it is contrary to our mission and cannot be advertised on YouTube. That's massive. That's a major statement. Now, on uh, over time, every week we get notified that this video or that video is not suitable for all advertisers. Uh, normally, the instant the video hits, I, I mean, before it has mm -hmm. a single view, we, we get flagged. And then you have to immediately say, OK, manual review, please. Every week we get good news. Your view, your your video, Dr. Brown answers your questions is suitable for all advertisers, mm -hmm. right? A and then the next one, same thing. Dr. Brown answers your questions is not suitable, and you can't make head or tail of it. One day there's a, a, a video where I'm really coming out against radical abortion laws, and it, and it gets approved. And the next day, five videos not approved. Well, two weeks ago, out of the blue. I happen to notice when just getting ready for our, our live stream on, on our radio show one day, it says your channel has now been demonetized. The whole mm. channel was 1,600 videos. So I contacted customer service immediately. I said, I looked at our account. We have no copyright violations. Any emails you sent to us said, uh, there's no, you know, you're not in trouble or anything like this. What's happened? Well, it's, it's copyright content issues. That's what they told me. I said, well, could you please tell me where and what? Because we're, we're not in violation. We have nothing on record. No, we, we're not obligated to tell you what you've done wrong. What you need to do is, is read the, the community guidelines. Again, it's like a little child. Read the family rules mm -hmm. and try to do better, and you can reapply in a month. So then we followed through. We need to know what's going on. They've refused to give us info. So we just talked to a lawyer today who's going to contact them and say, tell us where the issues are. Steven Crowder, I understand, went through something almost identical to this, alleged copyright violations, and each one they fought, and each one YouTube had to admit you did nothing wrong here. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's where things stand. The entire channel demonetized. Obviously, we're not alone, but mm -hmm. either YouTube and Google are unbelievably inept or unbelievably arrogant. Mm -hmm. Because the idea that they're not going to tell you what you yeah. allegedly did wrong to fix is is unreal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very, very disturbing. Um, I, I recently had a, a video um, taken down as hate speech. And in the video, all I said was uh, I referred to a prophecy uh, delivered by Muhammad when he said that a black man was going to eventually come and destroy the Kaaba. 
And uh, this is part of a long chain of Muhammad's claims about um, about black people. He said, you know, he referred to Ethiopians as raisin heads. He said that Satan looks like a black man. So that was just another in a long uh, series of, of videos. But I, I basically pointed out, hey, um, isn't this raising suspicions about black people if you say, hey, uh, a black man is going to come and destroy our Kaaba? And uh, that got that got uh, taken down as hate speech. Um, got me. Uh, uh, got me in strike. In YouTube, yeah, strike. YouTube jail for uh, for a week. Wasn't able to uh, to uh, to post. And so, yeah, things are. It seems like times are a changing. And a matter of fact, I should probably post a a video here in the next couple of days titled something like countdown to demonetization because I've heard I've heard the de demonetization thing from a couple of people now. And so it seems like. Yeah, it seems like they're uh, they're changing that uh, they're they're starting to crack down because YouTube used to be really really good about sticking up for people um, when you know people are coming saying YouTube you have to take this down oh we can't stand this guy you have to take it down and YouTube used to be very good about saying no this person hasn't violated any policies he hasn't done anything that's that's against our our community guidelines so no we're not taking it down uh, whereas now I don't know seems like uh, seems like the ideology there has changed a bit. You know, a, a, a couple of years ago, there was an experiment that was done by an Israeli organization on Facebook. They had two that. Facebook pages. One was, one was pro-Israel, one was pro-Palestinian. And in Hebrew, they posted messages that would be considered anti-Palestinian. And in Arabic, they posted messages that would be considered uh, anti-Israel. And the ones that got flagged were the ones considered anti-Palestinian. Yep. It, it, it's, it, it's remarkable. And my issue is just, just play by the rules. Mm -hmm. If you have rules, apply the rules consistently. And mm -hmm. then we can decide whether we want to play there or not. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's all. Just be fair. Apply the rules fairly, equally. If you talk about tolerance, diversity, uh, being inclusive, great. I, some years ago... Someone told me that they would not work with me because they were inclusive, and, and they they didn't get the irony of what they were saying. These are just no. code words, you know. Tolerance to the left means extreme intolerance of anything that violates their point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that seems to be the direction um, that everything is going. So yeah, I think we're going to see more content removed, more taken down, and. I hope YouTube doesn't go full social justice warrior, but all of these channels, all of the platforms are basically heading in, uh, in that direction. Um, all right, so have a comment here. Might as well just not pull any punches here. David Crane says, Dr. Brown is a heretic. <laughs> oh, uh, David, do you know Judah? Because uh, during my show today, Judah said that I'm a heretic and a fraud. Okay. So maybe you guys know each, know each other. Uh, but thanks. I'm so glad that you're listening and watching. The best thing is, please let me know where I'm a heretic yeah, and how I'm a fraud so I, I can fix that. All right? Don't be like YouTube. Don't accuse me without, without backing it up. So please let us know, and then I'll be, I'll be quick to get rid of that heresy. So, so thank you for weighing in there. Well, we, 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 can, do a little, we can do a little quiz right now. So uh, you believe in God, right? Yes, yes, one God only. Okay, do you believe that uh, Jesus died on the cross for sins? Yes, sir. You believe that he rose from the dead? Yes, sir. You believe that he is Lord? Yes, sir. Um, do you believe in a works-based salvation? No, sir. All right, those are the only those are the only New Testament requirements I can think of right there. <laughs> and we and we can expand on each of those and, and dig down a little deeper, but yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, hey, listen, If it, you know how it is. If a day goes by where I don't get accused by about 50 different people of 50 different heresies and sins and transgressions, it's not a good day. Yeah, that's how I think. Like, if, if, if I go a day w without, like, people threatening to uh, saw my head off, then I think, uh, what's, what's going on here? Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, this would be a good time. Um, so you weren't raised as a Christian, is that correct? Right. So I was born in New York City in a conservative Jewish home, raised on Long Island. But if folks aren't familiar with Judaism, conservative doesn't mean conservative like socially. It's just a, a Jewish movement about conserving traditions it, 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 while being modern and adaptive. So for me, Long Island conservative Judaism was, was pretty wishy-washy, to be honest. So, you know, we go to Sabbath service only for the high holy days, kind of like a Christian, nominal Christian that would go to church for Easter and Christmas. That's kind of the way it was with my family. My father would be more devoted and go more often. But when when I was born, mitzvah at the age of 13, 
I, I learned enough Hebrew to chant the portion of scripture that I was reading, but I didn't even know what it was. I just chanted it in Hebrew. I had no idea what the words were, nor did anyone sit down with me and say, okay, Michael, you should really now study this passage in English and understand the spiritual significance. That was just a matter of learning to chant it properly. And the, the big event for me was not my bar mitzvah. That was more of a social event with a big party that night. The big event uh, when I was 13 was seeing Jimi Hendrix in concert. Mm. I had been playing drums since I was eight. The Beatles came to America when I was nine. Yeah, you, uh, the whole you just dated, whole, you just dated yourself there. Yes, sir. Nineteen fifty-five. Yeah. Right. I was born, so thirteen years old in sixty-eight. Seeing Hendrix in concert, the whole rock scene, the uh, really appealed to me, and I started going to rock concerts day and night. You know, from Hendrix to Zeppelin to Grateful Dead to the Who. You know, all the the big bands, the Doors and Janis Joplin. Seeing all these groups in concert, and when I was fourteen. And someone asked me if I wanted to try getting high. I thought, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of like I mean, I'm not supposed to do it. So that had appeal, and all the rock stars do it. So I, I tried smoking pot, but it had no effect on me. So then someone gave me harder drugs. I tried smoking hash. That had no effect on me. So rather than quitting while I was ahead, I, I tried to experiment more. So very quickly, I was doing heavier drugs, ups and downs, and then hallucinogenic drugs like LSD. By the time I was 15, I was shooting heroin and was known in my school as Drug Bear and Iron Man because somehow I, I had a high resistance to drugs and I could put these massive quantities of drugs into my system and, and kind of function normally. So obviously I was destroying my life, but I thought I was just cool and look what I could do and we were going to be rock stars playing with, with a band and my two best friends started to go to a, a little Italian Pentecostal church in Queens, New York because they liked two girls who were going. The girls were going because their their uncle was the pastor and their dad had been praying for them. So first, the fact it was Pentecostal, that was interesting. You know, they believed in, in healing today and talked about angels and demons and things like that. And then the church taught a lot about end time prophecy. And, you know, my friends would come home. They weren't saved yet. We'd be getting high together and they'd be talking to me about beasts coming out of bottomless pits with seven heads and ten horns. And we're like... That's cool. That's because you know, we're hallucinating and all this. And little by little, God worked more deeply in their lives. They really came to the Lord. I went to the church to pull them out, and God began to deal with me. And people in that church began to pray for me. They weren't well educated. They they didn't know what the word apologetics meant, but they knew they knew the Lord. And they began to pray for me. And I didn't know what was happening, but little by little, the Holy Spirit began to convict me. Little by little, I became increasingly uncomfortable doing drugs, stealing money from my own father, uh, lying to my best friends. And the end of 1971, God worked in my heart for the first time. I, I believed that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead, but I wasn't willing to change. And I, and I wrestled from November 12th of 71 till December 17th of 71. I'd be in church one day and shooting heroin the next and back and forth and Finally, December 17th of, of 71, I surrendered. I said, Lord, I'll never put a needle in my arm again. I, w I was free from that night on. The love of God so flooded my life. And, and that was the, the beginning. Uh, when I told my dad what had happened, he was thrilled I was off drugs. But he said, that's great, but we're Jews. We don't believe this. He brought me to meet the local rabbi. So right literally out of the nest, I was dealing with rabbis and being challenged in my faith, but of course, it's ultimately for the good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, that, that's very interesting. You, you, uh, what you said at the end there—that you were you were taken to um, to the rabbi—and so that's that's how you started uh, interacting with the Jewish objections to Christianity. Uh, I'm saying that because I uh, that happens a lot in. Uh, in Islam, with with former Muslims, when Muslims leave, mm. when Muslims leave Islam, there 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 are two basic reactions from their family if their family uh, care ser seriously care about Islam, and uh, one is uh, you know you're dead to us, don't don't come back here, don't come back here until you're a Muslim again. So they just they uh, they kick them out. Um, but but uh, the other is all right, we're going to take you to a bunch of imams and sheikhs, and they're going to correct you and show you that Islam is true. But now these these uh, these new Christians are in the are stuck in the place of having to respond to the objections that these these Muslim uh, imams and so on have, and that 
that sort of brings them into apologetics and dealing with uh, dealing with objections to uh, Muslim objections to Christianity. So yeah, it works out uh, works out for the good there. And you know what's what's interesting, David, is that many people get religious when a family member goes in a different direction. Mm-hmm. So you'll have a nominal Jewish family, and and if say the daughter becomes an atheist, mm-hmm. who cares? Mm-hmm. If the daughter marries a, a Jewish Buddhist, who cares? If you know whatever, but if the person becomes a believer in Jesus, suddenly, well, we're Jews. We don't believe this. It becomes a big issue. And in the early days, uh, even though rabbis are by definition well educated, there's there's a much greater emphasis on study and learning. And rabbinic literature is vast and difficult. So your your average rabbi has more of an educational background than your average pastor or minister. But most of them didn't specialize in Jewish objections to Jesus or refuting the New Testament or things like that. So you had a few classic counter-missionary books, and then you had rabbis who specialized as counter-missionary rabbis. So you still have that. Uh, Some gentlemen I deal with sometimes on a daily basis. We're emailing each other and going back and forth. Counter-missionary rabbis, I know well. We consider each other friends in the midst of our differences, and we've been dialoguing in some cases for for 15, 20 years. But... uh, And there are groups like Jews for Judaism and things like that. But now the objections are ubiquitous because of Internet. uh, Anybody in, in, in five seconds can find objections. So we have to do our best to get the answers out there in just as widespread a way because anybody can access them. And, you know, I heard Josh McDowell say that objections that he used to deal with folks 18, 20 years old at college he now has to deal with 12 and 13 year olds raising the same objections, but they don't have the ability to process them intellectually and philosophically the same way. So, so it makes it even harder to reach them because they're just sound bites. So we've got to be able to do the same thing. Sound bite answers, in-depth answers, but make them fully accessible for everybody. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, so you became a Christian and then uh, you had to go to the rabbi. So what, what year are we talking there? So end of 1971 is when I came to faith. I first met with the rabbi early 72. Now, one thing that's important to remember, for a Muslim to say they became a Christian is very important and, and has a clear message in the Islamic world. If, if you say a Jew becomes a Christian, it means you're no longer a Jew. You've joined the other side. You have now joined those that persecuted us and hated us through the centuries. And if you're in Israel, for example, and you say, I'm a Christian, that means I'm Catholic or I'm Greek Orthodox. If you say, I'm a Messianic Jew, then you get to explain what that actually means. So depending on where you are, mm-hmm. uh, to say you're a Christian can have a certain meaning. Mm-hmm. And, and when you're sharing the gospel in Israel to a Jew, the first thing you have to explain is I'm not a Christian because that means mm. someone participating in a particular re- religion with a lot of baggage. And, and so in the earliest days in the New Testament, uh, to be called a Christian was one of these Christ followers, one of these, mm-hmm. these Christ ones. You know, it, it was probably a derogatory term, as you know, like, you know, oh, these are just brownites following this, this guy. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, some of the early historians, they thought, they thought it was Christian, this guy Christos, mm-hmm. whoever he was, and you're a follower of Christos. But since it became now another religion, so if you're a Christian, you're not a Jew, we always explain it. So in, in the early days, I would tell people I'm a Jewish Christian, which struck them as an oxymoron. Mm-hmm. As the term Messianic Jew became more common, it's like, ah, that works. Mm-hmm. Messianic is equivalent to Christian. And at least we're, we're telling someone, no, we are Jews who believe Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. We haven't converted to Islam where we reject the authority of, of the, the Torah of Moses. Rather, we see it in light of, of the ongoing scripture. Mm-hmm. So 1972, I first met the local rabbi, a fresh graduate from Jewish Theological Seminary, brilliant guy. We're still in contact here and there to this day. He's in his, in his early 70s now or mid-70s. And then he would bring me to other rabbis, and we'd talk. And finally, uh, around the summer of 73, at that point, I had been reading the Bible day and night and had read through the Bible cover to cover about five times. I had been memorizing 20 verses a day from the King James because I was still reading in English. So mm-hmm. I was immersed in Scripture. And, and he said to me, listen, Michael, here's the problem. He said, by nature, you're a more pious person than I am. If we were both Buddhists, 
you'd be a more pious Buddhist than me. So the problem is I'm not a religious enough Jew for you. He said, you need to meet Jews who are just as religious as you are, except they're right. So he brought me to Brooklyn, August of 73, to meet with Lubavitcher rabbis. So the followers of Lubavitcher Rebbe, Hasidic Jews, ultra-Orthodox. And in those days, the little Hebrew that I knew from my bar mitzvah days, I had pretty well forgotten. I hadn't started college yet, right? I started studying Hebrew afresh. And we sat down together, and first thing, these guys seemed to really love God. Mm-hmm. You know, when I remember when, when my rabbi met them on the street, uh, he shook their hands and said, how are you doing this? Thank God. And I thought, uh, you should say for a dead hypocritical Pharisee, I'm not doing bad, you know, <laughs> thank mm-hmm. God. And, and then we mm-hmm. began to talk about spiritual things, and, and they were talking about loving God and, and, and the joy of keeping his commandments and the privilege of serving God and, and the spiritual obstacles you have. And, you know, language that would sound very, change a couple words, and it sounded like church talk. And, and then I quote my scripture, and they quote theirs, except they're quoting in Hebrew, and I can't read Hebrew now, and mm. they're, they're saying, look, look, these English translations, they're terrible, and, and, and they're, they're saying, here, we're not going to lie to you. And they're going kind of letter by letter in the Hebrew, so now I feel like a little child. And, and, you know, they pray hours a day, and they were genuinely nice guys, and it really challenged me. It's like, you know, wow, these, these guys seem to want to wanna follow God and love God and just as spiritually minded as I am, and, and yet they're telling me I'm wrong, and they've got the Hebrew here, and they've got centuries of tradition and so on, and suddenly I felt, I felt very un-Jewish. You know, there they are, I look in their synagogue, and they're all there with their long beards and, 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 and reading from the Hebrew. It kind of felt like going back to biblical days, and, and here I am going to a church, and, you know, and so it was challenging, and, and, and I, I met with them a few more times, and that's what really forced me to have to dig in deeper. That was a key turning point where I said, okay, I am going to have to learn the Hebrew. I'm going to have to learn these texts. I can't rely on commentaries. I can't rely on dictionaries. I've got to know this well enough, uh, no matter how long it takes. And in the midst of it, challenged by them in several of these visits, I literally got on my face in prayer. And I said, God, as a Jew, I want to follow you no matter what. I want to follow you and your truth wherever it leads. I don't care what the cost or the consequence are. I just want to follow you and your truth. And in prayer, on my face, saying, if it means losing all my friends, and if it means the people in my church turning against me, or if it means, conversely, my whole Jewish world rejecting me, I just want you and your truth. And as I prayed, just flipped open my Bible, which coincidentally happened to open to Isaiah 53. Wow. And and it's like the words jumped off the page. It's as if God put them there for that moment to speak. And I remember saying, God, if you did not mean this, then then you are a deceiver. Because there was there was no earthly way I could see them as meaning anything differently than what I had what I believed. But and of course I've studied every angle of this for decades. But the reason I share that is because I know many people are really threatened by by anything that that cha- that, that that that's different than what they think and mm-hmm. believe. So I encourage everybody watching this and those that that follow David on his channel regularly, if if something challenges you and you're a believer in God, say, God, I want to follow your truth. Wherever that leads, give me the courage and the humility to do it. I know I did that with all my heart, and I was willing to renounce what I believed and become a traditional Jew if I was convinced that was the truth. It was God's truth that led me in the direction I continue on to this day. Wow. So um, <clears throat> when did you become like the ultimate go-to guy uh, <laughs> for for Messianic Jews? And I'm saying that because, uh, uh, again, I, I know uh, several uh, several um, Messianic Jews, and those who are interested in apologetics, they say it's basically you and then no one. And so they want to be like the, the next person, like their goal is, is to be... The, the the second the second version uh, number two or number three or number four or something like that. So. Yeah. So the goal is yeah for every for the other versions to pass the first version. But but here here's the the sad reality. I say it's like playing uh, center on the pygmy basketball team. You don't have to be all that tall. I've often been introduced as the world's foremost messianic Jewish apologist, and I said yeah number one among one. 
<laughs> now, thankfully, thankfully, more and more are being raised up. Mm-hmm. But sadly, this has been a blind spot for the church. I mean, I have taught at, at the two seminaries in America considered to be the, the leading apologetic seminaries in America. And when I first taught at them, neither of them had any program in Jewish apologetics mm. and or even realized there was a need for it. So what you have is you have a lot of Christian literature by great scholars dealing with messianic prophecy and things like that. Then you have a lot of popular literature from evangelistic groups like Jews for Jesus and things. But the, the Christian scholars are often not sensitive to the Jewish, to the Jewish needs. And, and the evangelistic ones are not dealing with the, the greater objections. So I looked at what was available. There was an old book by A. Luke and Williams on a manual of Christian evidence that, that had, had value, but it was somewhat dated and, and still didn't always have Jewish sensitivities. I looked at other things, and it was a little bit here, a little bit there. And what happened is some of the, the greatest Messianic Jewish thinkers were killed in the Holocaust. So you, you have a, mm. a gap there as well. So basically, there was nothing that existed. When, when I started answering some of the objections, one of my colleagues, a theologian, said, Mike, we don't have anything like this. And, and, and the reason, the first reason that I began my five-volume series, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, it was supposed to be three volumes, then went to four, then went to five. But the first reason I did it was not to reach non-believing Jews, but to strengthen fellow believers. Mm-hmm. I didn't want any of them to have to go through what I went through and the struggles and the challenges. I wanted the information to be there for them. And I also know that if we have confidence, if, if we as Jewish believers in Jesus or as Christians in general, if we have confidence, we're going to share our faith much more boldly. Mm-hmm. So that was my first audience, was, was not the unbeliever, but the believer. And then secondly, non-believing Jews. And uh, thankfully, more and more are being raised up. A lot of folks are using my material, uh, adopting it. Uh, others are specializing in certain areas. But there, there was just a need. It seems so strange mm-hmm. with this being so central. You know, the salvation of the Jewish people is a biblical theme, and Jesus and the apostles being Jews. It, it seems so strange that, you know, for example, when I started to look more at Islamic apologetics, I had three years of classical Arabic, often interacted with Muslims, but hadn't done formal apologetics like, like you and your colleagues, I was amazed to see how much more there was available in Christian apologetics mm-hmm. to Muslims than, than in Christian apologetics to Jews. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so basically you're saying the field is wide open here. And that, yes, that, sir. that young, young Messianic Jews who are wondering what they should do with their life is wide open for, for apologetics here. Yes, sir. And you're you're and, st- and you're not gonna you're not gonna be around forever here. Not in this world, right? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. So and, somewhat, and, some 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 other people need to step up. That's what, again, I'm saying it because I know my friends are watching. So, <laughs> yeah, and and here's the other thing. And thank God for those that are doing a great job and and that are out doing doing more and more. But you know, for years the word was that nobody will debate the rabbis. For years now, we haven't been. <clears throat> able to get rabbis to debate me. Now, some, they just don't like a debate format. I respect mm-hmm. that. They want to do things in writing or sit down in a different setting. I respect that. Not, not everyone likes public debates. But mm-hmm. it became very interesting. I said, well, when I didn't know anything, you wanted to debate me. Mm-hmm. Now that I learned a little, you, you don't want to. But the key for everything is mm-hmm. learn the Hebrew language and learn the Hebrew Bible well. Start mm-hmm. there. Don't, don't start learning all the brilliant arguments without knowing the language and the text. Start there. And then... If you can learn rabbinic literature, and that's the challenging thing. I, I mean, I remain a student in rabbinic literature. It's called Yom HaTalmud, the Sea of the Talmud. It is massive. It takes many lifetimes to master all of it. But to the extent we become familiar with it so that our arguments don't sound superficial. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it would be like, how much would a Muslim listen to you if when you quote quote the Quran, you know, you so butcher the Arabic that it's clear that you couldn't read a word of it, you know, if, mm-hmm. if it was handed to you on a, on a silver platter. Uh, if the, the more authentic we can be, I really understand your position, I've studied it, I see it from your viewpoint, I think I can represent your objection fairly and accurately, then we have authenticity. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you, you mentioned people not, not wanting to debate when you know what you're, what you're talking about. Uh, that, that might be a, a similar tendency. Um, we find it, uh, the sort of classic Muslim debaters, so people like 
uh, Ahmed Didat and Zakhar Naik and so on, they were happy to, or at least early on, Zakhar Naik doesn't debate anyone that I'm aware of anymore. But uh, back in the day, they were they were happy, even Shabir Ali, but until recently when he started occasionally dealing with Islamic topics. Um, but the uh, the classic Muslim debaters were happy to debate Christian topics like the deity of Christ or the reliability of the Bible or something like that. But they didn't want to go near Muslim topics like is Muhammad a true prophet? Is the Quran mm. the word of God? And it it seemed like I mean you'd wonder why, right? I mean these those, those are those are the the central issues for Muslims. If you can get on stage and present a case for that, I mean you, you've done you've done some amazing work. Why don't you guys want to get on stage? And I think it was that they understood that in the the Muslim community that if you grow up, um, and and you're not around, you're not around, you know. Christian apologists who are pointing out the, the 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 problems with Muhammad or the problems with the Quran, then you're you're not aware of most of them because your your leaders filter your information for you. So they tell you what they want you to 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 know and not not go beyond that, not not even be aware of a lot of the criticisms against Islam. And so it seems like a lot of the uh, the classic Muslim um, apologists and debaters didn't want to have any sort of public debate on those issues because they didn't want their fans, their followers to come out and even hear that there are these objections or hear that there even are these responses to to their objections to Christianity. So I'm just wondering if it might be a similar situation where, um, you know, if you have your if you have a, uh, if you have your your Jewish congregation and you don't want them to be aware that there are answers to some of the issues that they've um, been raising as far as uh, criticisms of the messianic movement, then probably don't want to step on stage and then hear that there are these these responses. Yeah, you know, Rabbi Shmuley believes that if you're not willing to, to battle things out in the marketplace of ideas, then you've already lost. And, and, and I respect that. I respect that too. Yeah, the, look, on the one hand, uh, debate is Christian debate has bad memories in the Jewish world because Jews would be forced to debate and and then the verdict was going to be you know rendered before they even started and if they quote lost they'd be exiled from countries or cartloads of Talmuds would be burned and things like that so any type of forced coerced yeah. debate is is obviously leaves a bad taste in people's mouths mm -hmm. but the other thing is and then there's the idea we we don't want to give you a platform, mm -hmm. just like I might not debate a Holocaust denier or something because I don't want to give the person a platform. But I've said for years we don't need a platform. We have a platform. People can readily find our material, especially now with with internet. We have a platform. We have a voice, and and there are some, and and they've told me in a traditional community we don't want you to plant seeds of doubt in people's hearts and minds. And what I've told them is. Uh, for example, Rabbi Shmuley once I said, come to our school and address our students on whatever subject you want. And he said, I want to tell them why they shouldn't proselytize Jews. I said, great, and I won't rebut you. You just have at it. And of course, all that did was light a fire in them to want to mm. reach Jewish people more with the gospel. Mm. But I invited one uh, ultra-Orthodox rabbi, counter-missionary, when I lived in Baltimore. Uh, and he lived in Baltimore, and, and I lived uh, in, in elsewhere in Maryland. And, and I invited him. Uh, I'm sorry, he lived in uh, New Jersey. I invited him. To come to our to come to our school, address our students without rebuttal, and then he and I would do a formal debate. And he said, "No, that's a waste of their time. They should be studying Torah, and I don't mm. want to expose them to your ideas." So we should be secure enough to say, "Raise all the questions, great, mm. and then let's look at the evidence and let's be honest. Mm -hmm. If we don't have an answer, we'll say we don't have an answer. If our answer seems so weak uh, that that <laughs> others can can you know drive drive a truck through through the holes in our arguments." Well, then let it be exposed. So that's my thing. It's not a matter of debating skills. Let's find the format that we're both comfortable with. Let's do it in a way that everyone could watch it and analyze it. Let's put the issues on the table for everyone to discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I agree with you that, that uh, I respect Rabbi Shmule for, uh, for, for being willing to, to get on stage and um, discuss these issues. In fact, I saw him, I saw him in a discussion with, a, with an atheist who I think was the president of, of American Atheists, but... Wow, he wreaked havoc on on her. Uh, it was uh, she 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 basically said that she could defend morality, right? Uh, the, the morality by saying, well, um, you know, we don't believe in any sort of objective morality, any any transcendent right or wrong, but we you know want to to get as much as we can out of life and to have as much pleasure as we can in life. And in order to do that, we all need to to play by the same rules. So if I want to have as much fun in life as I can, then 
I need to encourage everyone to follow rules that allow us to get as much pleasure as we can out of life. And uh, wow, he he tore right in. He's, really? Selfishness? That's what you're going to teach your kids. They need to be moral out of selfishness so they can have lots of pleasure. And, you know, just as he was pointing it out, it was like, yep, yeah, yeah, that is a that is a uh, that is a problem here. Um, all right. Well, we got about uh, we got about 10 minutes. Uh, I saw I saw uh, I saw Dr. Oakley. I saw Dr. Oakley in the chat. I don't know if that's him or, a, or a, uh, another account. I'm assuming it's him. Um, so, yeah, uh, we'll take a couple questions here. Um, got about again. about. Well, oh, go ahead. Yeah. What, what's interesting is that I've now been invited by Muslims. We're, we're hoping uh, to make it to make it work. And, and it, hopefully Dr. Oakley and I. I can team up together because I don't specialize in, in Islam. Again, I've got decent background, but I don't specialize in it, and I respect those who do it for apologetics. But I've been asked, okay, well, would I be willing to debate is Muhammad prophesied in the Hebrew Bible? I was just thinking and, that'd be a great topic for you. Yeah, and and then you know uh, some that would be you know a more Christian topic, and and so hopefully uh, later this year in England, uh, I'll I'll be doing that. And, and hopefully uh, with, with James White and I, we can do some things t together. But it's, what, what I was not aware of, though, uh, was the reticence of some to, to address issues like your raising mm -hmm. or the perfection of the Quran or, or things like that. So that's very interesting to, to hear. And yeah. obviously, that you know, there, if there's an insecurity in the position, or you don't want mm -hmm. anyone to question it, how strong can your faith be if you, if you've got to shelter people from questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it, it, it is it is a bit different from the the younger generation. You do have a younger generation of Muslims who will uh, tackle those issues. Does usually doesn't go very well for them, um, but they'll at least agree to. Like I've debated, um, is Muhammad a true prophet? Probably like eight or nine times now with Muslims, but not, not with the, you know, the, the, the traditional Muslim apologists. They, they usually won't touch issues like that. Um, all right. So let's take a few questions here. So this goes back to the issue of, uh, demonetization. And so the question is, because there are, you, you might be aware of it. There are people who, as soon as a platform starts doing people dirty, well, you, you ban the platform, you boycott the platform. So the uh, John here says, if they're demonetizing you and shutting you down, why are you still here? Well, number one, I'm reaching people. That's the first reason I'm there. In, in other words, uh, I was never on YouTube to make money, and we, we were putting videos up before we, were, we even realized we could be monetized. So as long as I can reach people and get the message out, I'm doing it. That's, that's number one. Number two, we're getting our videos out every other way that, that we know how. And number three, we're challenging YouTube. If it turns out that they act in unethical ways or they end up muzzling us, then the time may come when we're, we're not there. We constantly look for other alternative places. But look, when I write an article every day, we, we put it out. Every site that will post it, let it be posted. And, and if, if it ends up being a hindrance, then we'll go somewhere else. This much we know, though. If money does come in, it's a blessing. We're glad to have it, whether it's $100 or $1,000 or whatever. We're happy to have it to pour back into ministry. We're nonprofit. So it just helps us produce more videos or do more radio shows or things like that. But we're not dependent on it. We're dependent on the Lord and the idea that we would change our message or compromise anything we're doing to get money from a secular platform or any platform, God forbid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I agree there because uh, if I were to, if I were to boycott every platform that did something wrong or uh like took some of my content down i wouldn't be i wouldn't be on any platforms right i mean you wouldn't be living yeah you wouldn't be able to use a credit card a cell phone fly a plane drive a car get gas at a gas station and on and on yeah so the, the idea is everyone's doing this ladies and gentlemen. facebook is doing this twitter is doing this patreon's doing this youtube is doing this if you want to say oh they they did something that's messed up let's get off the platforms you're going to be off off all the platforms and i'm uh, going to make it really difficult to to reach people on the internet so um i'm kind of for you know driving down the road here until the wheels fall off on on these uh these platforms um here's a question uh, why do most Jews not know about Isaiah 53? And is that correct? Would you say that most Jews are not familiar with, with Isaiah 53? Or right, let, let me answer that in a few levels. <clears throat> First, when you say most Jews, if you're talking worldwide, most Jews are not religious. Mm -hmm. Say at least 90% of American Jews are not religious. And in Israel, maybe 70% are not religious. So that means they're not familiar with the Bible, 
period. That's the mm-hmm. first thing. The second thing is uh, religious Jews are, are reading Torah repeatedly through the year. They are praying uh, daily uh, lots of scripture, psalms and other verses. They are reading other select portions through the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and then at certain times of the year, other portions are read, like Purim that we just celebrated. The book of Esther is read at that time. But they're not reading through the whole Bible. So that means if they're not reading through the whole Bible, that they may not be familiar with all the passages as well. They're reading a ton of other literature, but they're not just reading through the Bible like a typical Christian. Mm -hmm. They're reading through the Torah repeatedly. Now here's the rub. Here's the controversy. In the Torah, in the weekly reading, you have something called the Haftarah. That's the supplemental reading. So it's going to be something from Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, or Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets. It's going to be from one of those sections. And there's, there's a section read from Isaiah 52, and then there's a section read from Isaiah 54, but Isaiah 53 is not read. Mm. So the controversy is... Has it been left out intentionally? Now, there are other places that skip chapters for, for no good reason, except it ties in with the content better. There is one ancient tradition that suggests that it was removed, that it used to be read in the synagogues, and it was removed because of controversy. Another tradition says, no, it was, it was never one of the passages read, and there's debate among scholars in it. If you take out what's called the rabbinic Bible, that's the Hebrew Bible with rabbinic commentaries in many, many volumes. You'll see all the rabbis comment on Isaiah 53. You'll see that they're all familiar with that. The Targums, the Aramaic translation slash paraphrases, they're there just the same. So uh, it all depends who you're talking to. Many traditional Jews are not familiar with the text because it's not part of the synagogue reading. And that's where mm-hmm. the notion is that it's been taken out or hidden away. And, and it may be true. But it's in the Bibles. Anyone that's studying Isaiah is going to read it. Uh, I know a, a, a Christian professor, a minister, was going to Yeshiva University in New York City uh, to take a class one time on the book of Isaiah. And when he, when he went in, somehow as a Christian, was in the class with these other Orthodox Jews, he, he had his, his nice Hebrew Bible there ready for the class. He looked around. None of them had Bibles. And he thought, what's going on? Well, they had all memorized Isaiah in preparation for the class. So oh, wow. it, it, all, it all depends on who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is a controversy that it's not read in the synagogue mm-hmm. as one of the weekly portions. Was it removed? Maybe so. Mm-hmm. And uh, what, what's interesting is if it, if it was deliberately removed, then that can actually – it can help people who want to uh, – show that Jesus is the Messiah because they have an opportunity to get some new information and show what the what the Jewish scriptures actually say and it can be actually yes. it, can, it can be it can be surprising my I have a friend um, he's, he's on the program here regularly with me but um, Anthony Rogers and his wife's family um, are Jewish and uh, he was having a conversation with uh, one of them one day and uh, Tony said, uh, "Well, here, just let, let, let's look at some of this." And he reads Isaiah 53, and the the guy says, "Look, uh, we don't believe in the New Testament. Get out of there. We only believe in the old. We only believe yep. in what you call the Old Testament." And he's like, "That is it. It's right there." Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> we we that is an almost universal experience when you come from a home that's not that religious, so that they they would almost certainly not be familiar with the text, and you read it. Uh, I've I've seen people, you know, family members, people close, get angry, lose their temper. Uh, others say, that, you know, one of my friends when he read it to his dad, same thing. We don't believe in the New Testament. He said, No, 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 Dad, this is the Bible I was given when I was bar mitzvah, the English Bible. Here's the rabbi's signature, and he said, No, 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 somebody changed it. So yes, it retains tremendous power. My friend Mitch Glazer with Chosen People Ministries, based in Brooklyn, some years ago. He invested a lot of money in an Isaiah 53 campaign. He took out a full-page ad in the New York Times just with the text of Isaiah 53. Wow. Who is this talking about? And then if you went in and out of the Lincoln Tunnel for some months, there were these giant billboards with a snippet of Isaiah 53. Who is this speaking of? So millions of people literally saw it coming in, going out, just getting the message out. So yes, read it and say, who who's this describing? Who does this sound like? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a... Uh... Yeah, that's awesome stuff here. Um, uh, all right, a couple more questions here. Uh, Carmo says, um, Dr. Brown, my book arrived today. What's the best verse or verses against the pre-trib rapture? 
Yeah, so not afraid of the Antichrist, why we don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture by Craig Keener and yours truly. That's the book she's referring to. Obviously, we don't believe it's taught in the Bible, with all respect to our friends that hold that. And therefore, we would say it's the absence of the clear teaching, which is the, the biggest issue. Where is it explicitly said that the rapture and second coming are separate events? But I think Second Thessalonians 1 and 2 are about the strongest extended passage. The first chapter telling us that we'll receive rest and relief when the Lord comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God. So it's his public appearing in vengeance where we receive relief. That's when we're caught up to meet him as he descends. And then 2 Thessalonians 2, where Paul says, don't let anybody disturb you about our being gathered to the Lord, the day of the Lord. Don't let anyone disturb you about that as, as if this came unawares. No, this day can't happen until the apostasy comes first and then the man of sin is revealed. So certain things have to happen first before that very public event. Um, couple more, couple more here before we uh, close out. You do have, uh, where did he go? L. Ryan again saying that... Um, Let's see. All right. We know this is we know this is an issue, so just want you to have an opportunity to uh, to address uh, the criticism. Michael Brown is a heretic because he partners and promotes heretics. So, well, there. That's interesting because he's not saying you have heretical views. Well, okay. Let's let's go ahead and read. Michael Brown is a heretic because he partners and promotes heretics. He has an unbiblical understanding of the gifts of the spirit as well as a false view of manifestations of the spirit now that that's interesting because i'm not aware i'm not aware of that classifying you as a heretic unbiblical understanding of the gifts of the spirit so what are your views of the gifts of the spirit dr brown just what the bible says okay so <laughs> <laughs> no I, I listen i would joyfully uh debate anyone on this anytime and look i've written a book called playing with holy fire that addresses abuses in the Pentecostal charismatic movement that came out last year. Back in 91, I wrote a book called Whatever Happened to the Power of God Is the Charismatic Church Slain in the Spirit or Down for the Count? So, uh, I, I'm going to be Skyping Nigeria in, in the next 48 hours talking about abuses that are common that we have to deal with. So uh, I, if, if there are abuses in the movement, yeah, of, of course we're going to address those. But I'm quite convinced by Scripture that the gifts of the Spirit are here, the the outpouring of the Spirit is for the entire New Testament period until Jesus returns, as Peter says in Acts 2, that that the Spirit is for you, your children, and all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call it. The outpouring of the Spirit with prophecy and those kinds of things is what, what uh, Peter expressly says in the second chapter of Acts, is in these last days. So I understand that while apostles had unique authority and wrote scripture, and, and no one has that authority today, that gifts of healing and miracles and tongues and prophecy are to be the norm until Jesus returns. Every one of us indwelt by the Spirit the moment we're saved, but there are manifestations as the Holy Spirit works through us that I believe are for today. And you know, you know what's interesting? Uh, I, I am sure that I'm going to get condemned by some people for being on your channel, Dr. Wood, tonight. You and are. you're going to get condemned. You're going to get condemned for having me on. Oh, I already am. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but the bottom, and look, the <laughs> fact is, I'll go into all kinds of settings to have discussion and, and interact. And sometimes afterwards, it's like, nah, it probably wasn't the best setting. Or I tried to get the message out in that setting, but it wasn't the best setting. But otherwise, if a door is open, I'll do my best to walk through it and, mm -hmm. and get a message out. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as, are, do you partner with and promote heretics? <laughs> Without names there. Okay. <laughs> I do not knowingly partner with okay. heretics. I reach out to heretics with the gospel. But if you want to say <clears throat> that any charismatic or Pentecostal leader today is a heretic, then I'm sure I partner with some of them. Mm -hmm. If you want to say that David Wood or, or James White is a heretic, look, I'm told James White is a heretic because he's a Calvinist, and he's told I'm a heretic because I'm an Arminian. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, you know the thing that's fun, though? It's, it's sad. I say fun, but please tell us exactly what we're doing wrong. Please tell us who the heretics are. Define heresy. But I'll tell you this. Anything that I hold to, 
I will gla- any fundamental thing I hold to, I will gladly, joyfully have a debate on it with any mm-hmm. qualified opponent. And it's few and far between that are willing to step up and debate. Yep. Um, and so the, the, accu- the, the first accusation here was that you're a heretic because you partner with her- her- heretics. So heretic by association. And the other was that you have uh, uh, an, unbib- an unbiblical understanding of the gifts of the Spirit even though you said that your view of the gifts of the Spirit is what the Bible says about the gifts of the Spirit. So the Bible presents an unbiblical, um, an unbiblical view yeah, of the, I mean, the gifts I mean, look, of the Spirit. Uh, obviously, I was being facetious and answering it in such short terms, but bottom mm-hmm. line, I don't base my theology on experience. Mm-hmm. In other words, if I pray for someone to be healed and they're not healed, that does not determine to me whether healing is for today or not. And if someone is healed, I can't make a doctrine out of that. I've got to base things on Scripture and Scripture alone. I, I have a book, in, uh, a chapter in my book, Authentic Fire, which, uh, which I wrote as a gracious response to John MacArthur's Strange Fire. And in it, I have a chapter called Sola Scriptura and Therefore Charismatic. And what's interesting is I've had a number of readers, quite a few, tell me, I've got to be honest with you, I became a cessationist. I denied the gifts and power of the Spirit for today because of bad experience, Mm. but you've convinced me scripturally that they're for today. Now I have to work this out for myself. So that's my issue. What does Scripture say? And very, very happy to debate that and discuss that. But it could well be that I'm considered a heretic because I I work and teach for non-charismatics. I teach at non-charismatic seminaries and and Reformed theologians I work with, so who knows what I'm getting accused of. I could be getting accused of heresy because I work in in the Messianic Jewish movement. And and if you say, you know, we celebrate the Sabbath on the seventh day, you're considered a heretic by some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, uh, some people are really, really, really quick to pull that that heretic card. I don't, unless I'm joking, like I call all my friends heretics and stuff, but um, usually yeah. if I'm calling someone a heretic, it would be because they don't believe Jesus died for sins, or they, they don't believe in the deity of Christ, or or something like that. Um, so, yeah, apparently that term is used very, uh, very, loosely. very, very loosely here on the internet. Yeah. All right, one last, one last uh, question, we'll wrap up with this. Um, has Dr. Brown ever considered debating Ben Shapiro? I'm bringing this up because a lot of people uh, posted a question, this a similar question here. Has Dr. Brown ever considered debating Ben Shapiro on the deity of Christ, his resurrection, or the truth of the New Testament? I'm asking because he is arguably the most famous practicing Jew. So if Ben Shapiro were ever willing, would you be interested in a debate on Jesus? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, Any time. I think it would be great. I think it would be really enlightening. Obviously, Ben can speak well for himself, and he's a sharp debater. Actually, because I got so many requests about this that I shot him a note, I don't know, a year, a year plus ago. Mm-hmm. And and I uh, I said, hey, listen, I, I, I assume you don't want to do this. I didn't want him to feel like there was any pressure from me. Not that he'd respond to pressure. I said, I assume you don't want to do this, but I'm constantly getting asked about us doing a public debate or dialogue. I had sent him my book, The Real Kosher Jesus, at one point, and I said, I- I'd love to do it. What do you think about it? And he wrote back immediately, uh, Dr. Brown, I really don't enjoy religious debates, but you know, thanks and whatever, and, and-, and left it there. Now, I know he's debated some atheists and others since then. Uh, he had Pastor John MacArthur actually on uh, on his show, and I thought Pastor MacArthur did a great job in, in discussing those issues. So uh, the best thing is, if enough folks ask him to do it, maybe he'll do it. He's obviously not afraid to. Mm-hmm. My my thought would be this, though, uh, and, and I don't want to speak for Ben. I don't, I don't want to read something into this, but like Dennis Prager, like Michael Medved, these other Jewish intellectuals, they have great relations with the evangelical church. And, and they make clear, we respect Christianity, and, and we respect it as a legitimate faith for you. And my argument is, that can't be. Because if, if, if Jesus did die for our sins, did rise from the dead, and is the one who fulfilled Messianic prophecy, then he's for everybody, Jew and Gentile. If he didn't do those things, if he's mm-hmm. not the one who fulfilled the prophecies, didn't really die for our sins, didn't really rise from the dead, then no one should believe in him. In other mm-hmm. words, the only way that he's the savior of, of, of the world is that he's the Messiah of Israel. So I, I don't know. And, and again, I, I don't want to suggest this is the case beyond my, my wondering about it. 
could it be that a debate with someone like me could be alienating to the evangelical Christians that, that love Ben Shapiro and, and respect him and, and appreciate his boldness and love to see him as a voice on, on secular TV and things like that. So I'm sure he's not afraid of a debate. That's not his issue. Mm-hmm. But is, is it worthwhile? Uh, you know, I've interacted with Dennis Prager some in, in, in the last year and, you know, a very friendly, positive way. But I know for him it wouldn't be a productive kind of thing because that, that's mm-hmm. not an argument he wants to have with someone like me. So hopefully the doors will open. I, mm-hmm. I look forward to it. I, th- I think it would be good. We can both talk fast enough to get a lot of stuff in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that would that would be epic. And, and even, a, you know, I, I understand the point of, you know, if, if he has certain issues that he wants to to get across to people, then you don't want to get sidetracked by by other issues. But I, th- I think everyone would love that. I think all his uh, all his, his, his Christian fans would would uh, would love to see. It. I think it sets a good example, too. Right. Hey, we're not we're not killing each other over over these kinds of issues. And we could both get up here and uh, and uh, and share this. And I'd love to see him debate just because with his with his with his quick brain. He said he studies. Uh, I think he said he studies the, the Talmud every single day. Um, so yeah, that would be epic. I can't imagine a, a much more epic debate uh, than that. So those of you who are out there, if you want to uh, contact Ben Shapiro and say Dr. Brown here is ready um, to uh, to discuss this issue and explain why you'd like to see it, hey, if, if enough people want to see it, then uh, then then it could happen. All right, well we're gonna wrap up with well. I have to uh, respond to this lie right here. Uh, Victor says David is a heretic because he pour <laughs> because he pours his milk in before his cereal. Uh, everyone who's been um, spreading that lie, it, it's not true. Um, I don't. I eat my cereal like everyone. Although Nabil was a, for those of you who remember Nabil, Nabil was a heretic. There, um, he would keep his milk and cereal separate. He kept his milk in a cup. He would take a bite of cereal and then take a sip of milk. He said that this kept his his cereal from getting soggy. So that's uh, that's heresy. All right, Dr. Brown, any uh, final thoughts or uh, advice for everyone? Yeah, well, I just avoid dairy entirely, and this this keep because <laughs> I just live with I just live with too much controversy. But look, I tweeted this out. And I know that you'd affirm these principles, Dr. Wood. Uh, these are ministry principles I live by. Number one, avoid conflict and controversy at all costs. Number two, never, ever use sarcasm. Yeah. Uh, that being said, visit our website, AskDrBrown.org, and click on the link that says Consider This. You'll see the videos that have drawn so much controversy. We've got a brand new one uh, coming out in a matter of weeks. Is Jesus kosher for Jews. But we've got our first six or seven videos up there. So go to AskDrBrown.org, click on Consider This. I think you'll enjoy those. And let us know how we can be of help to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, for those of you who, who tuned in after uh, we shared the the contact info, uh, Dr. Brown's website, his Twitter page, and his YouTube channel are all down in the description box. So be sure to subscribe to his YouTube channel, which is uh, not on good terms with YouTube right now. But uh, yeah, it, it, keep, you know, be sure to be sure to subscribe where because we don't know how bad things yeah, are going to get. Yeah, keep subscribing. Keep subscribing. Do it. Subscribe it. and and I I do believe that there'll make a course correction at some point be, because I I just don't think they can ultimately if they're going to come down on one way that's so radically left it's it's just it's going to mm-hmm. look money is still an idol for people you know it's going to cost them too much but we'll see as long as the door is open we'll keep walking through it and as long as they're doing wrong we'll keep confronting them all right and that was uh that was great advice about uh no sarcasm and uh Ever. remember my family advice if you're going to walk on thin ice you might as well dance <laughs> that's it see you all next time